Everyone who works in biology knows that information is needed in order for a living cell to do what it does. On the other hand, there's this huge mystery surrounding information because we also know as humans that information doesn't come from nowhere, it has to come from somewhere. So you have this big question mark in the origins question in biology, where did all the information come from? Until 530 million years ago, the oceans of the early Earth were almost completely void of animal life. Then, within a geologically brief span of perhaps 10 million years, the waters were suddenly alive, teeming with a riot of complex animals, representing most of the major animal body plans that have ever existed on our planet. Known today as the Cambrian Explosion, this mysterious episode in life's history was familiar to Charles Darwin, who regarded it as a disturbing challenge to his theory of gradual and unguided evolution by natural selection. During the past century, the mystery of the Cambrian explosion has deepened as scientists have discovered the central role played by biological information in the history of life. The Cambrian explosion is not just an, an explosion or the abrupt appearance of many new forms of animal life. It's also an explosion or would have required a huge infusion or generation of new biological information. Biological form requires biological information. Scientists' understanding of biological information advanced dramatically when Cambridge University researchers James Watson and Francis Crick made a startling discovery. They found that the structure of the DNA molecule stores information in the form of a four-character digital code. Strings of precisely sequenced chemicals called nucleotide bases supply the assembly instructions, the information for building the crucial protein molecules that living cells need to survive. Crick later came to realize that the chemical constituents in DNA function like letters in a written language or digital symbols in a section of computer code. Just as English letters convey a particular message depending on their arrangement, the sequences of chemical bases along the spine of the DNA molecule convey precise instructions for building proteins. The arrangement of these bases directs the arrangement of the 20 different kinds of amino acids that make up protein molecules. Proteins in turn perform a vast array of critical jobs inside cells, catalyzing reactions, processing genetic information, and forming the structural parts of molecular machines and other biological structures. Building new animals requires many new protein molecules and building new proteins requires new biological information. I, I used to ask my students a question when I was teaching. If you want to give your computer a new function, what do you have to give it? And they would know. They would say code or software or uh, instructions, uh, a program, all those are the correct answer. To generate a new function in a computer, you have to have code, you have to have instructions. The same thing turns out to be true in biology. This is the great discovery of the second half of 20th century biology, that information is running the show in biological systems. To build a new form of animal life requires cell types, requires proteins, and therefore requires genetic information. And that's the big question that the Cambrian explosion presents. If you want to think about how to build an animal, how would these animals get built, you have to have some explanation for the informational requirements of, of their construction. According to modern evolutionary theory, new proteins and new forms of animal life arise through random genetic mutations, sifted by natural selection. 
but in an alphabetic text or a section of computer code, random changes typically degrade meaning or functionality and ultimately generate gibberish. As we've come to appreciate the digital or typographic character of genetic information, we also, it raises some really interesting questions about the efficacy of that mutation-driven mechanism. Uh, and, and we know from computer code, for example, that if you start making random changes to a section of computer code, you're much more likely to degrade the information that's there already than you are to come up with a new operating system or program. This problem has long been recognized by computer scientists, mathematicians and engineers, including a group from MIT who convened a now famous conference at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia in 1966. These scientists met to consider whether the random mutation natural selection mechanism could conceivably generate enough biological information to build a new animal or even a new protein in the time available to the evolutionary process. One of these scientists was MIT engineering professor Murray Eden. No currently existing formal language can tolerate random changes in the symbol sequences which express its sentences. Meaning is almost invariably destroyed. Murray Eden, MIT. Eden knew that random changes to alphabetic or digital characters inevitably degrade the information in any section of alphabetic text or digital code, and for a very good reason. Whether you're talking about digital code in a software program or a section of text in an English sentence or book, or uh, the, the genetic text in DNA, there are vastly more ways to arrange the relevant characters that convey the information in a way that will produce gibberish than there are to, that will produce function or meaning. Eden and his colleagues suspected that the genetic code faced a similar difficulty. When it came to producing new genetic information, at least enough to generate a new protein, the random mutation natural selection mechanism had to deal with what mathematicians call a combinatorial problem. In mathematics, the term combinatorial refers to the number of possible ways that a set of objects can be arranged or combined. In genetics, the combinatorial problem poses a severe challenge to the random mutation natural selection mechanism. To understand why, imagine a thief who would like to steal a beautiful new bike. All that stands between the thief and the bike is a lock with four dials, each marked with the numbers 0 to 9. But there is only one correct combination that will set the bike free. The reason a bike lock works is that there are vastly more ways of arranging those numeric characters that will keep the lock closed than there are that will open the lock. A thief without knowledge of the combination must guess the right combination from among 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 possibilities. That's 10,000 possible combinations, which usually would be more than enough to defeat a random search for the one right combination. Yet there is still a way the thief might succeed. If he has enough time to try enough combinations, he might eventually identify the right one by chance. For example, if trying each combination takes 10 seconds, then in 15 hours, an especially diligent thief could try more than 5,000 combinations, or more than half of the total possible combinations. In that case, he would be more likely to succeed than to fail in opening the lock. But now imagine a much more complicated lock. Instead of four dials, this lock has 10 dials. Instead of 10,000 possible combinations, this lock has 10 to the 10th power, or 10 billion possible combinations. With only one combination that will open the lock out of 10 billion, it's much more likely that the thief will fail, even if he devotes his entire life to the task. So what about relying on random mutations to search for a new DNA sequence capable of directing the construction of a new functional protein? Would such a random search for new genetic information be more likely to succeed or fail in the time available to the evolutionary process? In other words, is a random mutational search for a new gene or protein more like the search for the combination on the four-dial lock 
or the 10 dialogue. The scientists at the Wistar conference were unable to definitively answer that question because at the time, no one could adequately quantify how hard the search problem was. So in the late 1960s, um, one could make these arguments based upon analogy to things we understood, written language, computer code, but we didn't have any experimental data to show whether those analogies actually suited the biological case. So no one could come up with the exact numbers to answer these questions back then. Molecular biologists at the time did know that the number of possible combinations corresponding to any given sequence of DNA is extremely large and grows exponentially with the length of the molecule in question. For example, corresponding to one short protein 150 amino acids long, there are 10 to the 195th power other amino acid arrangements of that length. That's an unimaginably large number. But scientists in the 1960s didn't know how many of those arrangements were actually functional. They didn't know, in effect, how many combinations would open the lock. That didn't stop evolutionary biologists from speculating. Many argued that there must be a high proportion of functional sequences among all possible sequences, so that a random search for a new functional sequence would have a high probability of success. The way they did that, to so say, well, maybe biological sequences are not nearly as finicky, not nearly as picky about which characters are where as written languages or as computer code is. And so that's the track that they took that maybe proteins don't really care which amino acid is where and there's a great deal of variability and therefore you can have the same function performed by a huge number of protein chains and a huge number of genes. But recent experiments in molecular biology and protein science have replaced speculation with data. These experiments have established that DNA-based sequences capable of making functional proteins are in fact extremely rare among the vast number of possible sequences. Just how rare? After working at Cambridge University, molecular biologist Douglas Axe set out to answer that question using a technique called site-directed mutagenesis. His experiments enabled him to estimate that for every DNA sequence that generates a functional protein of just 150 amino acids in length, there are 10 to the 77th amino acid arrangements that will not fold into a stable three-dimensional protein structure capable of performing that biological function. One correct sequence for every 10 to the 77th power incorrect sequences. That's equivalent to searching for just one combination on a lock with 10 digits on each of 77 dials. To put this in perspective, keep in mind that there are only 10 to the 65th atoms in the entire Milky Way galaxy. Could random genetic mutations effectively search a space of possibilities that large in order to find even a single functional protein sequence? So given that you have this very uh, daunting probability, 1 in 10 to the 77th power, um, how could something that improbable happen? Well, as we know generally with improbable things, the way that they can happen is by having lots and lots of opportunities for them to happen. So for life, those opportunities take the form of individual living organisms in which a mutation could occur that could conceivably provide the solution. No matter how rare it is, if you get enough of these opportunities, it can become probable. So the question is, if the number is 1 in 10 to the 77th power, if that's the improbability that must be overcome, would the number of organisms that, is, that have existed on the planet since the beginning of life come close to matching that number? And it turns out that it doesn't come anywhere close. During the entire three and a half billion year history of life on Earth, it is estimated that only 10 to the 40th individual organisms have ever lived. Yet 10 to the 40th power represents only a small fraction of 10 to the 77th power. Only one 10 trillion trillion trillionth to be exact. In other words, for even a single functioning protein fold to arise, the mutation selection mechanism would have time to search just a tiny fraction of the total number of relevant sequences one ten trillion trillion trillionth of the total possibilities. 
it follows that it is overwhelmingly likely that a random mutational search would have failed to produce even one new functional protein fold in the entire history of life on Earth. Of course, the building of new animals would actually require the creation of many new proteins. For this and other reasons, a number of scientists are now questioning the creative power of the random mutation natural selection mechanism. Even evolutionary biologists writing in professional peer-reviewed biology journals are acknowledging difficulties with traditional evolutionary theory. Some are willing to admit we already live in a post-Darwinian era, while others are calling for new theories of evolution. Maya and Axe are part of a growing minority that has urged the consideration of another possibility. For Maya, the recognition of that other possibility grew out of his work as a PhD student in the philosophy of science at Cambridge University. During his studies, Maya ended up examining the scientific method used by Charles Darwin in his classic work on the origin of species. Darwin's method focused on trying to establish the causes of events in the remote past, in history. Darwin's historical scientific method is different from what many people ordinarily think of science. It's a much more forensic style of reasoning than your ordinary experimental bench science. Uh, you're reasoning from the clues that are left behind, from the, the evidence that we have before us, back to the probable or possible causes that might explain what produced life in the first place or what produced animal life or what produced those clues that lie before us. And I ended up doing my dissertation uh, in Cambridge on the, the historical scientific method. And one of the things I, I discovered in the process of my research was that, that there was this distinctive method. It has a name. And that name is the method of multiple competing hypotheses or the method of inferring to the best explanation. But how do scientists studying biological history determine which explanation is actually best? Meyer found an answer again in the work of Darwin and his contemporary, the great geologist Charles Lyell, who argued that in explaining the past, the present is the key. Lyell insisted that we should seek explanations based on our knowledge of presently acting causes or causes now in operation. All this led Maya to ask a critical question. What is the cause now in operation for the production of digital information? Because the crucial question in the origin of animal life and the origin of life itself is where did the information come from, information stored digitally in the DNA molecule, where did that information come from that is necessary to build these new forms of life? And I realized that the answer to that question is intelligence. The cause now in operation, the cause of which we know from our uniform and repeated experience, another key uh, idea from Lyell, uh, that is capable of producing information is intelligence. Whether we're looking at a hieroglyphic inscription, or a paragraph in a book, or a section of computer code, or even information embedded in a radio signal, whenever we see information, especially when we find information in a digital or typographic form, and we trace it back to its ultimate source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. So the discovery that information is running the show in life, the discovery that there are these huge infusions of information in the history of life, such as the one that occurs in the Cambrian explosion, suggests that a designing intelligence has played a role in the history of life. And it also suggested to me that it was possible to formulate a scientific case for intelligent design that is a case for intelligent design based on the same scientific method of reasoning that Charles Darwin had used in The Origin of Species. And so if you want to say intelligent design isn't science, uh, you would have to say that the Darwinian argument in The Origin of Species is also not science, but no one really wants to say that. He's not using an unscientific method, he's just using a different method of scientific reasoning, an historical method of scientific reasoning, and I use that exact same method in formulating the positive case for intelligent design in both Darwin's doubt and in Signature in the Cell.